how is work changing? I talked to Ritesh Gupta, the CEO and founder of Useful School, about that very topic. We also get into AI and where that's going to go next. My name's Andrew Hogan. I'm head of insights at Figma, and this is FigBrew. This is part of Figma's FigBrew series, which is an internal conversation that we have about what's going on in the industry, key topics, and we bring in experts and we hear from them. And we thought you might want to see some of it too. Hope you enjoy. This one, I just came back on a, an amazing trip to Guatemala after a much needed vacation. And I got this one. Oh, it's beautiful. It's ceramic. Here's one of my favorites. Amoeba music. All right. All right. Single-celled organisms. I have this other one that's green, but another side. It just says mug. Ugh. Just a few of my favorite things. Ratish, welcome to Fig Brew. So glad that you're on. Thanks for joining. I'm so excited. I've been so excited to finally talk to you about all the topics we were like kind of briefly reviewing together earlier. And I was just like, I am so excited. I've got some statistics I want to share. I've got some hot takes. I've got some cold takes. I've got some lukewarm takes. I've got all of the takes. Facts, all kinds of temperatures of takes. I love it. Let's get into it. So one of the things that we've talked about at Figma is that work has changed. The way that people do work has shifted dramatically. Do we see more people involved in projects? We see more distributed work. So the amount of work from home has, has um, 5 x since before the pandemic. And we just see like more work in progress and the expectation that it'll be continuously work in progress. Do you see the same things? What What's your experience? What's your reaction to that? Are we just making stuff up? Before I answer that, I want to kind of ground these thoughts in a specific place and where they're coming from. So where I'm coming from is from an education point of view. I'm coming from a mentor and sponsor point of view. I'm coming from a designer, project manager, product manager. I'm coming from a variety of different lenses, but generally speaking from a from the creative the creative world. So I think you're they're sort of like a coach to the creative environment, creative creators. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm in that kind of creator world. Like I'm either working directly with creators or people who actually creating stuff for on the, you know, as clients and with clients. So I think number one, collaboration is fundamentally changing from this idea of this kind of like quote unquote human centered design, design thinking, a lot of the stuff that we've been hearing about from the kind of IDEO lens. And I think we're shifting away from that into a place where we want to make sure the right people are working on the right things. So what that means is being a lot more diligent about who are the people we choose to work with and put on the projects and making sure we're taking special care in that regard. For example, I've seen in the past given this idea of human-centered design and kind of empathy and compassion where a designer who doesn't match the intersectionality of the product and who is going to be using that product, this idea of just being able to drop in to a project and kind of immersing yourself and then kind of calling it a day if you ask the right questions to like the right users is out the window. What's happening right now is this idea that we should reflect the identities of the people that we're building for. And ideally, the people who is building the thing matches the identity of the people who are using the thing. For example, I recently worked on a website that serves a population that reflects my own identities. During our first design review, the client was literally like, wow, Ratish, you got it. You know exactly what to right on our website, you knew what our challenge was and all of that. And that's not necessary to say that somebody who didn't match the identity couldn't do that because there's an added element of somebody matching and playing matchmaker. It makes the work just a little bit more efficient and a little bit more exciting, especially from the, cl from the client point of view. So I think that's one thing of like this shift in what collaboration looks like and how we choose the people to work on the projects. And then the other thing I'll say is that like, if you're not matching the population that the product is serving or the people that are serving, then I always try to recommend like to try to use the best research methods to, to get at that. And I think what we're 
moving away from is this idea of just immersing yourself, asking a few questions to quote unquote users, and then leaving. And I think where I'm starting to see a lot of places move towards is hiring those people along the process. So instead of just interviewing them once and not paying them, you're actually like hiring them as kind of almost like consultants in a way where you're able to bring them along the entire process. There's nothing worse than dropping into a place, taking some photos and not showing the person you took a photo of the photo, right? Like that's what I'm kind of talking about. This idea of design tourism is a problem in itself. And I, st I think at the very least what people can do is to make sure that they're hiring and guiding and showing the work to those folks that they're interviewing and showing the work as it's progressing along the entire process, not just in the quote unquote user research phase. Well, so it sounds like you're really sort of um, design tourism. You're very skeptical of the idea of sort of like dropping in, making some improvements, making some recommendations, dropping out. And even in there, I've, it sounds like you're skeptical of the sort of like traditional co-creation process, which... I think was a little more like you do a workshop with the people who are in the target and then you make some stuff and you talk about it and then you're out. You you sort of see them being throughout in multiple iterations. Correct, correct. I'm I'm thinking that the current status quo is version 0.5 of design and the design process. And there's so many places to go uh, and things to do um, and to modify in our process to get us closer to like a V1. And the reason I'm not I'm saying that it's a V.5 rather than a V1 is that V1 should be serving a lot more people. So once once the process serves a lot more people and it's a lot healthier and more collaborative, then I'll call it 1.0. But for now, I'm calling it 0.5. And I think something I'm also getting at is this idea that research doesn't just happen as the first part of our project. And then we move on to the wireframes, then we move on to the logo design, then we move on to this and that. That linear process, it doesn't match with how a lot of designers think. It doesn't match how a lot of BIPOC individuals think and work. And it doesn't match how a lot of neurodivergent people think and work. And so to have this process that we've been ingratiated in um, for, for, for a few decades now, we're not actually working to the benefit of not only the population that we're building for, but also we're not working and matching towards how we think as humans. So let me give an example. I think what's better to do is say, hey, we're going to do research throughout the entire process. And as things emerge, we are going to modify the type treatment. We are going to modify the color scheme. We are going to modify the design system in general to allow for these really interesting insights that sometimes come at 11, you know, the 11th hour um, to use that trope. So I think to allow our process to shift um, into a more nonlinear approach is going to be really helpful. And I think what segues perfectly into that is this idea of in this new world of design in a hybrid model that I want to see more flexibility for designers to be encouraged to design when they feel like designing or when when the iron strikes, if, we, if I can use that metaphor. So instead of forcing a person to come up with a logo between nine and noon and then present between three and four, like how might we think about reframing that and saying, hey, designer, as long as you get it done by this you know general date, we will work backwards to figure out what the right checkpoints are to understand like what kind of feedback you need to that matches like your practice. Let me give you an example. A lot of neurodivergent people who aren't strong in impromptu brainstorming will feel very much hindered when a, a manager invites a group of designers, including them, to brainstorm something and say, hey, eye in the sky, blue ocean thinking, what could we do here? What that typically does, it enables people who are quicker thinkers or need a little bit less time to to think and also feel more confident in in speaking their mind even if the idea is a little bit less baked this idea of flexibility also needs to come in when it comes to the actual feedback and how we give feedback 
So one of our actual graduates gave a really amazing talk on how might we think about altering our feedback methods when we're talking about internal design reviews to allow for a variety of, of neurodivergence and a variety of intersectionalities, including people who are more shy at work and people who are less shy. Those are the types of things that I'm really excited about in terms of how how might we think about nonlinearity as it comes to practice in terms of not only output, but also the inputs and the processes. When I'm talking about neurodivergence, I'm talking about this wide spectrum of neurodivergence. And um, that includes, for example, those with ADHD, that includes those who have autism, that includes a variety of people who are quote unquote divergent from the quote unquote, quote unquote norm um, or typical. It's typically helpful to think about it in terms of sometimes cognitive speeds, but it's also really helpful to think about in terms of the support that they might need. So for example, somebody with ADHD might have a better time doing certain parts of the design process, whereas they might not do better in others. So making sure that we're thinking, you know, not labeling somebody as, oh, this person has ADHD, thinking about, hey, this person needs this types of support and this person flourishes when we give them these things or we make sure that the environment is catered to these types of things. There's nothing worse than saying, hey, this person has this and or lives with this and there's no understanding or no conversation about what kind of support they need. Because of that, it's treated as a hindrance rather than a a place of abundance, right? So we talk a lot about useful school. Actually, in, in fact, Aziz Ali, who has spoken at nearly every cohort we've given, he talks about having people of color coming from a place of abundance rather than scarcity. So this idea that a specific cultural identity is uh, an asset rather than a deficit. So how, and in a similar way, how might your neurodivergence come to fruition in that way? So I love to talk about people um, and with with people that I that I work with to make sure that they know that what they live with and their lived experience is an asset, not a hindrance. That seems like it really connects to your idea of having people represented who are users of the product or the population that you know, design, like having them involved, that becomes a point of abundance um, instead of, uh, you know, this person has a different set of experiences and works in a different way. If you're trying to represent the users, the users are very diverse typically. And the argument for inclusion and more accessible design is a relatively easy argument to make. You say, hey, some people aren't able to literally use our product. We are going to build it in a way so people can use our product. And therefore, we should get more users, right? So some managers need that kind of like use case or that kind of goal case in order to like actually say, all right, we're actually going to invest time and relationships into it. But where it falls off is that a lot of companies don't realize and don't wrestle with the fact that a lot of people in their companies themselves need more support. So to have a manager sign off finally on a, hey, we're going to finally do an accessibility audit for the users of our app is often at odds and confusing if they're not giving similar support to the people who are actually building the work who also reflect those identities. So it's important to make sure that like when a manager or somebody who has decision-making power says that they care about accessibility and they care about certain intersectionalities, that they're not just doing it just externally for the actual app itself or the website they're building, but also making sure that they're setting up systems and clarifying certain things like promotions, et cetera, et cetera, for internal people. So that way there's no cognitive dissonance. And you were going to talk about Bi BIPOC too. Yeah. So, I mean and so BIPOC is a relatively new term compared to some of the other terms that we we have heard related to race um, and, other, and other identifiers. What I mean by that is that there's people of color, and specifically, there are Black and Indigenous people of color that we should make sure that we're putting at the forefront and make sure that they're visibly known. So we have the term people of color, and then we have the term BIPOC. And sometimes people use them interchangeably. When I mention BIPOC, I want to make sure that people know that we are prioritizing and making sure that the experiences of Black and Indigenous people are understood to be while they might be similar to POC in general, that they're very specific and we should make sure that we're putting them front and center. So there's certain situations where 
you might hear the term BIPOC versus might hear the hear the term people of color. You know, you've got this this situation where work is work is different. There's greater amounts of flexibility that could be afforded. There's potentially like some more confusion about, you know, how to participate. What are the norms? Some of those things are unwritten. You mentioned a little bit about proximity, hiring. And then I think one other thing that would be useful for us to do is to back up. What is useful school? How does that relate to some of what you're describing here and, and what people in useful school um, have, have found helpful? But yeah, proximity hiring, proximity firing. Let me clarify and, and talk a little bit about what I mean by proximity stuff and then how that affects useful school and what I see as the future of collaboration. So what we're what we know right now, and there's been multiple studies published about this, is that while there's a lot of push for hybrid and or remote only workplaces, it can be at the disservice to a lot of people who actually need more support. So let me explain. When you're in a remote environment, you have less proximity physically com compared to some of your other colleagues who might be closer proximity to, for example, your manager. And when there is closer proximity, that means it's a little bit easier to have those kind of side conversations or hang out at a bar or do some sort of like it builds, has builds like rapport. There's there's a natural rapport building that happens in these exactly. little little increments. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So these casual chit chats can really start to not only reaffirm biases, but also really widen the gap between people who are remote and people who are able to like meet up with their manager more physically. So what's really important to, to also know is that there has been shown both anecdotally and in the data that people who are more remote, more than likely than not, have less of a chance of getting promoted as compared to people who are in closer proximity to the people who have decision-making power. What's really important is to make sure that there's like really equitable support to staff. This idea of likability, this idea of proximity is not in any way, shape or form influencing what the promotion schedule might, might look like. So as long as it's written down into your company's laws and under the, in the agreements that you're going to look at very specific criteria when you're determining if people are getting promoted or not, that's going to help more remote people feel more comfortable taking on a job that's truly remote that they and they don't have to worry about this proximity bias. Now, what's ir ironic about this is that remote people want to be remote, but they're experiencing screen fatigue. Uh, they might need more increased support from their manager for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's related to their identity in some way, uh, maybe neurodivergence, maybe they feel imposter syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. So what's happening is that people who need support, who, who might be remote, are screen fatigued and they're tired of actually talking. So what ends up happening is you have this vicious cycle of people who need support, not getting the support, and then that is happening over here. And then over here, you have all these other people who are, are able to meet up with their boss in Brooklyn go shopping, grab a coffee, et cetera, et cetera, and not experiencing as much screen fatigue. It's really important that that managers are very conscious of all of these little hidden biases that could eventually rear their ugly heads when it actually comes to promotions. Some things that you could potentially do in addition to making sure that there's equitable support for staff is when you do have these in-person chats, um, you make sure that everyone is able to like participate. So you actually fly in the people who are potentially further away to actually have like a more casual hang. So that way everyone's able to to participate. The other thing that I've started to see within uh, meetings is actually there's certain software where actually it tracks the amount of time certain people are talking. Now, in this interview, it's going to be like 99% retiche <laughs> as I'm answering some of your questions. So I realize some of the ir irony here, but it's really helpful in at least just having a little bit of a little nudge of being like, hey, Ratish or the other person, let's have a little bit more balance of a conversation when they're supposed to be balanced here. So that's where I'm really excited about is like this idea of hybrid collaboration, but making sure that it's not happening at behest of the people who truly need it. I'm familiar with the study about, you know, promotions. Uh, I think I I've, I've read that there are some challenges around the data that was underlying that and how they actually determined it. But the question of do you get promoted more if you 
chat more with your boss or if you chat more with people who are influential to the promotion sort of to build trust. Like I think we, from an eye test perspective, we'd all wonder uh, what impact that that has. Making sure that the access to those kinds of chats is is equitable. And, you know, we've all felt the, the Zoom fatigue, the screen fatigue. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've switched some conversations to be phone only. Uh, just to you know take a walk and change it change it up a little bit and maybe that's another another tactic to build some rapport what's happening with remote and hybrid work as well is people are not only screen fatigue but they're also audio fatigue and that's also part in the fact that a lot of our equipment isn't amazing like a lot of us are using like not great microphones we're not necessarily using great cameras so i'm i'm excited in the future for more companies to invest in their employees to give them, you know, a better audio visual experience. So that way there's a less likelihood of fatigue. Vision, there have been, vision pros? Are they all getting vision pros? Is that, is that maybe, what you're doing? Maybe. Um, I actually, I recently watched a breakdown by uh, MKBHD and their podcast around, you know, what the vision pro is going to come with and, and all of that. And there's some really interesting things that are happening there. I won't repeat his stuff. You all can watch that video. Yeah, maybe, maybe at some but point. But it's a, it's a new, it's almost like a dress code question now, which is that, that, that is tough. That is, you know, dress codes are tricky. Like what do you wear to work? What's okay? What's the expectation? And then, you know, what's the expectation of audio quality and video quality? We've introduced this whole other element. What's going on in your background? And one, one thing on that, I think is I, I could make the argument and I've seen uh, a lot of the people call that we worked with like really using their Zoom background and like the stuff that they wear, like from here up, like as like a big asset. There's a lot of opportunity to express ourselves with a lot of personality, have different backgrounds all the time and and really show off so, like similar to YouTubers, like some little hidden thing in the background that's like, oh, wow, that's like really amazing. We are, I have like, we are all streamers now. And that is, right. that is, you you, if you think about it as an asset, to go back to your point earlier, this interesting thing I have is an asset now. That is, that's pretty interesting. What what would be really cool, and I would love to see this, is like more designers during design reviews to leverage things like Twitch for reviews, to make the reviews a little bit more fun and a little bit more casual. And because there's emojis and a lot of things that like you can't really get like on a Zoom, this experience is totally different. So to, and there's also apps like Gather where you can look like create your own little, um, kind of like 64 bit like emoji and it looks really good and i think that's like really really interesting now compare that to the apple vision pro where when you actually take a whole scan of your face if you change your hairstyle it's not going to know that at this point at least in this kind of v1 version of it the hair is going to be the same the, the neck is, is going to be the exact same position on your on your sweater even if you're wearing something different so this is a really important point that is really proving that a lot of the remote things that we're doing can be discriminatory. So for example, people who change their hairstyle all the time, people who wear different things, maybe due to religious reasons, they might not be able to reflect everything they're wearing at in real time because the apps that they're using, like the Apple Vision Pro's like scanning app, isn't reflecting themselves in real time. They're kind of stuck in the identity that they might have had in, in the past, right? So I think there's a lot of problematic things that are happening with within the the this kind of collaborative space that can also be at the 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 behest of other people who need it and deserve to be supported. I mean, it really drives home the idea of change and the idea that work has changed because these are all considerations that were not really a priority in 2019. Maybe they should have been. Now it's a question of how are you going to co collaborate, you know, asynchronously so that everybody can participate. How are you going to set up? you know, a conversation uh, that's synchronous to be successful and so people can, you know, express themselves and, you know, if they want to have fun while they're doing it, can they do that? It just points to a dramatic change over a really short period of time. When I was running a design team in the past, we were really struggling to figure out, hey, we love this like remote situation. We don't want to travel all the way to our office. Why should we ever meet in person? And I think what the clear reasons for us to meet in person were to do things like book swaps, where we literally would take our books, we would gather them, and then we would trade them in person. That can't happen, it, you know, without without being in person. Also, like design teams, I want more design teams to 
do offsites and do offsites in places that could be inspirational for for them. So, for example, like going to a specific place, like, for example, there's a bajillion museums. There's actually one in, in New York City that specializes in posters. So it's called Poster House. And like we went as a past team, we gathered a ton of inspiration for a potential project. So I think this idea of like when you do meet in person, like what are the things that you you can do only in person that you can't get virtually? That's a question that's always on designers' minds. So I want to make sure I encourage as many managers to think about what are the things that they could truly do that get everybody really excited, not only really excited, but also really grounded and helpful into like what the work could potentially become. And again, that could be going to a place or training things for inspiration. That could be learning about a specific population better. You know, there's a lot, variety of things that I was like more. You're speaking to a lot of intentionality that is need, now needed. If you're going to reduce the amount of in-person time, the intentionality is so much more important of that in-person time. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I really going to improve? Like, of the aspects of team, what am I really going to work on? Am I going to brainstorm? There, there's a heart. Uh, am I, am I going to brainstorm uh, or am I going to try to get inspired or am I going to increase team cohesion? Yeah. It's like you're, you're curating a party in some sort of like D and D campaign just to be a gigantic nerd about it. Everybody's talking about AI. The thing I set you for inspiration was some UX audit thing on GPT four with screenshots, kind of skeptical of this. The, the reviewers were skeptical of this. Are you skeptical of this? And what else are you seeing out there? All right, so I've got a lot of thoughts on this one, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let it let, let it go. let it rip. There's a few thoughts I have. There's things that give me pause, uh, and then there's things that give me a little bit of excitement. I think the things that give me pause are the fact that like a lot of UX audit stuff has been leveraged for a long time now, right? Like Google Search Console can do a lot of stuff. Like their website crawlers do a pretty good job of like some very, very basic code based things. Then there's things that like that the Baybird research thing that really gave me, you know, a lot of skepticism as well. And so I think out of their conclusions or out of the, the experiment they ran? Both. So I'm, uh, so I am dubious about how they conducted the work. And then I'm dubious about what that means it just in general, even if I didn't have that data. And then I'm also just dubious just in general. So I think I think number one is that the Baymerd study essentially showed that there was an 80% error rate, right, of ChatGPT going through stuff, going through a website and saying, hey, these are some UX recommendations we have. They also said that there's between a 14 and 26% discoverability rate where essentially they're giving useless suggestions, Harmful suggestion. That is low. 14 to 26% is low. Usually not what you want. So oh, you want. Baymar did not come to the conclusion that this was useful. They're also even worse. They're like overlooking stuff completely, like obvious stuff. Now, they're also comparing ChatGBT for in this really early, in my opinion, early days to a human auditor, right? They even said in the report, highly trained leveraging thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours. They are, they are leaders in this sort of review. This is the right. thing that they do. Yeah, This is what they do. This is what they're trained to do. They have. They even quoted in their article over 130,000 hours of large-scale UX research. Comparing those two things can really be like apples and oranges. You can leverage the Ch chat GBT tool to do some quick analysis, right? So this is where I'm like, kind of like, all right, I get it. You could do some quick analysis you know that some of it will be incorrect. And then maybe you check with a human. Cost is very like, low to do it. Like yeah. you put the image up there and then you you get something back. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. But at the same time, if you're going to have to check with a human anyways, it's probably going to take longer for a human to review the results from the AI, balance the cognitive dissonance of saying, oh, well, AI is really recommending it, but I don't really know if this is right. So then they have to do this kind of decision making between something that's probably wrong or potentially wrong versus their own kind of quote unquote expertise. So that could even become a waste of time. And we also know that it's bad at cognitive reflection tests. We know where in certain situations, it's been shown that some of these AI tools are just bad at giving the right answer, where there might be a difference between intuition and kind of a gut response and the actual like correct answer. So let me give you an example. All right, so a bat and a ball. In total, they cost a dollar and ten cents. Oh, I, I'm terrible at these. You're not going to ask me, are you? Like, I'm. 
But I'm definitely going to ask you. Oh, no. Okay. All right. So bat and a ball, in total, they cost $1. ten. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Uh, Ritish, I have literally never answered one of these correctly. I want to say a dollar, but I know that the answer isn't a dollar because you wouldn't be asking me this question. Everyone watching this video, pause, think about it. Okay, and when you're ready, like, unpause. All right, so a lot of people will immediately say 10 cents, but that's not right, okay? It's actually 5 cents. And there have been evidence where ChatGPT and other AI tools will give this 10 cents answer and not the correct answer. What we really need to be doing and thinking about is not only asking it for the reasoning, you know, the show the work that our math teachers used to always like beg us to do, but also we need to increase the training that it is able to pull from, right? So that's a really important thing to think about. The other thing to know is that ChatGPT and these other AI tools, they're, they're limited by the amount of research that they can pull. So that's why it's really important to like increase the research training that it can do, right? And what happens if there's a huge sea change in terms of like how we conduct UX research, what UX research is good for and, and not good for, what the conclusions are, you know, how will Ch ChatGBT or any of these become more real time? And then on top of that, there's things that AI can't do, right? They can't take into account cultural differences. They can't take into account cultural nuance, right? And so one website or app that's praised in the UX research world, maybe in, you know, the, 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 the main circles that we know of, might be completely unwelcome in another culture that doesn't call it UX research, that doesn't call it, you know, the things that we're talking about. So these are the reasons why I'm kind of have mixed feelings, you know, a, a, about this stuff. And, and I think going back to the implications of the study and the conclusion that Baymerd had, the implications are really important, right? Imagine using AI, you know, maybe you're a startup or a, a big company. You willy nilly use AI to do a, a UX audit of your website. You then end up making the conclusions that you need to make all these changes, right? So you use a design resources, tech resources, that includes, you know, time, money, energy, et cetera. And then you update the website and the app only to realize you didn't even fix the right things. You made the product worse off and then a bunch of issues still remain, right? That's a that's a terrible thing to be in, right? And so I also will challenge Baymerd, will they ever conclude that AI is ready? Like what's their like binary like understanding of saying, this is when AI is proven to be good at versus not are we constantly going to be comparing ChatGPT4 to like a human expert that's specialized in this? Or is there something different, right? Like what are the use cases that they would say? I'm dubious that Baymer would actually be willing to give ChatGPT all their proprietary research, right? That's currently behind a paywall. And would they do that for the betterment of broader AI UX industries? Is there a financial incentive for, for them to do so? So I think that's why I'm a little dubious in like this idea of Baymer being a completely objective truth and not necessarily leading us to to drink from a certain faucet that they want us to drink from. Potentially, you know, they could have a tool that would be really helpful for their internal reviewers and they could try to set it up that way. And that might make reviews faster. That might make their, you know, their humans more creative. But if not designed well, it could absolutely make them make worse recommendations, worse recommendations more quickly, um, which isn't what they would want either. Um, so it just points to the role of, I think, the design in this. It points to the role of training data in this. It points to how early we are in this. I was at a speaking at a, a, the user testing conference actually last year. I think everybody absolutely has to be prepared for this question of like, hey, I ran this through this UX audit thing and it said that we should do this stuff. Or, you know, I asked ChatGPT what... Uh, you know, a, a dad in California would think about our product and it said this, what do we think about that? You know, someone is going to bring that to you. And as a, as a, you know, some sort of experienced design or designer professional or researcher, you just have to be prepared to have a conversation about it. Puts you in a good position with that person because you probably won't be able to just dismiss it as ridiculous. You probably have to take it seriously. Totally. And maybe useful school we should launch an ai ethics class like we have it on our application uh six percent of people who have taken uh who have filled out the survey have said that they specifically want that so maybe we do an ai ethics class and like help people understand how and when to use it 
when to not use it, and then like to what degree do you use it for, and all the questions that are surrounded the output and inputs. So I'm really excited about it. Like I'm really excited about like figuring out how and when we use AI. Yeah. Um, especially especially when it comes to like research, when it comes to like the betterment of people of color, neurodivergent individuals, queer people, etc. Um, and that and that really goes to my next point. So the, here's what I did. So I asked ChatGPT the same exact question, but applying it to Figma and Figma's website. I did it applying to Useful Skills website. And then I did a follow-up. So okay. they Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the results. All right. Okay. What are the results? All right. So basically, the question that Baymerd asked ChatGPT was, "What UX improvements should be made to this, you know, website?" Right. So I did the same thing for Figma, and I did the same thing for Useful School. Guess what? The suggestions that they gave for both our website, Useful School's website, and Figma's were largely the same, and they're largely pretty generic. A lot of UX research people would probably be able to like tell those things. So I think the other thing that I want to highlight is that broad question, broad answer. Yeah. Okay. So when I modified the question to say, what improvements from a UX point of view should be made to the usefulschool.com website, assuming most visitors are people of color, the answers became a little bit different. The answers became more specific. They were talking about thinking about inclusivity, they were talking about representation, they were talking about cultural sensitivity, all of those types of things, right? My point being is that when you ask ChatGPT a broad question, it's going to give you a broad answer. Mm. And they're going to be largely generic, and they're going to be pretty same across a lot of websites, which leads me to believe that they're not really using the most up-to-date and the most customized approach. The second thing I'll say is that when you ask a question this broad, like what UX improvements could be made, if you ask something that generic, it's going to forget about historically excluded groups. There wasn't a single indication in their responses to the initial question that Baymert asked when I applied it to Figma and the Useful School website that had any indication about suggestions related to people of color, his, any other historically excluded groups. So it's really important when you're asking ChatGBT suggestions that you're framing as much context as possible. And not only that, knowing that even if you go really, really specific, you're probably not going to get a very specific or nuanced answer. The other thing that I'll do is I'll give you not only generic answers, but it's going to give you generic answers um, that will say the same thing in three different bullets. So that's what I would say is the issue with ChatGBT going through broad questions and expecting specific answers, not caring enough about pe people of color. And we, we've known this, but now I know it in the actual data. What I would generally say is maybe use ChatGBT audits as like maybe a checklist, but know that you could probably find better checklists made by humans on the internet. NNN Group, a variety of other places have checklists. Baymert has checklists, right? And you could pay a relatively low amount of money for them. So you maybe use those as starting points. It's kind of similar to how I use Wirecutter or another review site. Like I will use the suggestions on Wirecutter knowing that it's not going to tell me exactly what I need to buy in terms of like an iron or a backpack. And yes, I've spent hundreds of hours looking up a perfect iron and no, I haven't found the perfect one, but I use it as a place to get, you know, some criteria, maybe some definite no's because like certain things that they've reviewed are like talked about in the comments, right? And so then I'll use Reddit, my own intuition, friends, colleagues, et cetera. This situation is very similar. Like it's think about your own lived experience and what you it, need, right? Yeah, it's a it's a thinking tool. It's a way to I don't know. It's like writing a, out a document. Some some people write in order to think, and this is sort of the same kind of thing. You sort of talk in order to think, but this is something that is just going to sit there and wait for you to talk to it. Most other people won't. There will come a day probably where ChatGPT will give you notifications based on changes you made, right? So it says. Initially, it was like the current status quo where it's like, hey, I need help with this thing. Give me this thing. Then you make a change on your website or app. And then imagine ChatGBT or Bard or any of these others hitting you up via email. Be like, hey, notice you made this change. Here's 10 other suggestions I have. At some point, it might truly become a chat when it actually becomes reflective and responsive to the actual work that we actually build based on it. And I think that's where the groundbreaking research will and the, the interesting things are actually going to happen.
Yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's sort of acting like an agent that's performing a task sort of continuously in the background, not waiting for not waiting for the prompt necessarily, and then it has context in order to be more helpful because it's you know hooked into wherever, whatever, uh, you know, the live site or the designs or whatever. Totally. And, and I'm not, I'm also not quite certain how much chat GBT will be helpful in terms of like other parts of the design process, including, you know, copywriting, including like making sure that it's not recommending like tricky copy, making sure it's not recommending like tricky UX patterns, you know, all of those types of things. And so I think, I think there's more to be said about what it can be used in the future. But until then, I'm going to be using like my own lived experience, lived experience of other people, and maybe using ChatGPT at the very least for some entertainment. So Ratish, I know one of your big projects that you've been doing, you're, I mean, the, the company that you run, the organization that you run is Useful School. Tell us a little bit about that. Who comes to that? What have you, what have you been doing there? And maybe what are some of the things you've learned? We are the world's first Hey, will you can online school for people of color. There's no required specific tuition amount. We are specifically covering lessons and introducing our community to people of color that match their intersectionalities. It means that it's a cohort driven model where we do about 12 weeks at a time. It's real time. It's all remote on Zoom. And we've done a few different topics now. We've done prog design branding, financial wellness, and decolonization and divestment. All of these topics are directly related to not only what we're talking about, but also what specifically people of color need and, and want at, in this day and age. We primarily work with students who are relatively experienced in their roles. And we typically work with, for example, prog designers who have been working in the prog design industry for a few years and helping them get more leadership, helping them get more money, helping them get promoted, et cetera, et cetera. We also have a few classes that are more on the beginner level, but our big focus right now is helping the wide variety of people of color who are incredibly talented and they're at the mid and senior levels, helping them break into leadership positions, have decision-making power. The way we do that is covering lessons that range from thinking about your own intersectionality and your lived experience and how might that affect the work you do, how you show up to work, what you say, how you dress, the inspiration you pull, et cetera, et cetera, knowing that you're coming from a place of abundance rather than scarcity, covering everything from there all the way through how to negotiate really well, a specific person of color with a specific intersectionality. So those are the types of lessons and those are the types of things that we do that aren't really covered in a lot of places for people of color. And I'm really excited. We've worked with over 200 people so far, and we have a ton happening in the future. We've got a lot of stuff planned in, in terms of additional classes. It sounds like an AI ethics one might be really interesting. And uh, we're gonna also be working on a summit. Uh, we might even come out with our own version of our own entity that does work with and by and for brands and other other individuals. I'm very, very excited. And so, yeah, I, I literally cannot wait for the future. I didn't realize, and I don't think actually other people would realize, um, the focus on sort of mid, mid-level, because, you know, but you think of like a, the mental model is like a school or a boot camp is for people who are trying to break into an industry. And what you're describing is people who are in the industry who are like, I would like to move up. I would like to have more influence. I would like to make more money. Or I would like to figure out why, you know, some parts of this job are really hard. What What are some of the things that you've sort of learned in working with that group of people who have some things in common and obviously many things that are different um, that maybe people wouldn't expect? You know, what's interesting about that. I was also thinking about like, you know, school and the paradigm shift of like thinking of like where might people think that people are when they come to useful school. We've been very, very fortunate that we've had thousands of applicants um, and we haven't really had that issue of perception. However, I could always like be more clear. Absolutely. Like with the fact that we primarily cater and focus and serve uh, and support people who are further along their career. So I love that. 
I love that advice. Um, so I will take that into account for sure. In terms of like what I've learned, there's a variety of things. I think number one is that a lot of individuals who are in the design industry, especially at the mid senior on up are craving community. They're craving a, a, what Reddit or another place would call a niche community, a very hyper specific community that can be, you know, three to five people that not only people can have asked questions to, um, get emotional support, philosophical support, talking about like, should I take this job on or this job? Those types of things. I mean, there's a bunch of like amazing people that are on LinkedIn and YouTube and TikTok that are helping people kind of at scale and talking about videos of like, choose this job or this job. But there's so many nuances to a specific person that need and want like a much more community driven aspect. And when I when I started the school, I didn't think that the community aspect would be pretty much the number one reason, or at least in the top three of like why somebody would join. I was like more focused on, you know, the programming, who would who would actually be invited to speak and all of that. But time and time again, in nearly every cohort, the number one thing is building community, having a stronger sense of grounding in the work, increased confidence, less imposter syndrome, um, and all of that. And the 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 data has shown at this point that those aspects of our identities are nourished and tended to, then it's much more likely that they're going to get promoted, they're going to open up their own practices, et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton of data out there that there's very, very few practices that are by people of color, even less, you know, when you when you break down the intersectionality and from there. To be able to empower individuals who are on the cusp of opening their own practices, controlling their own destiny more than they already are, and even joining companies to have like more leadership positions is a really important play place for us to play. Um, and we're going to continue doubling and tripling down on on working with with individuals at, at that level. Fascinating. Um, big insight for, for me about the impact there. I can absolutely see, you know, what would be possible. People just want to talk to other people about what they're experiencing and what those people are experiencing. They want to try to help call it mentoring or just call it like conversations with people that you, you know, you respect or can see yourself with. So that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. And then the other thing that I would have been surprised by is a lot of companies want us to work with their employees to bring the curriculum that we're, we're doing to teams, to up-level teams. So taking our curriculum, modifying it to, for a specific brand or a set of people has been really exciting. And, you know, we have the IP, we have the we have the knowledge and the skills and excitement to continue working with with brands. And so we want to continue doing that. And we're really excited about, you know, if people want to reach out, they, they totally can. I think the other thing that is really exciting as well is that we've been able to also like hire graduates to do work, you know, by or with useful school and or with companies. And I think this idea of making sure that people know that, a lot of lived experiences are really valuable and no matter what level somebody's at, having them be empowered and encouraged to talk about their specific lived experience in front of other people can be really, really vulnerable, but also really helpful in terms of like building confidence, in terms of empathizing more with individuals, et cetera, et cetera. So I also encourage and I've seen the results of people going through programs like Useful School, getting excited presenting, you know, a specific aspect of their ex experience and their existence to their coworkers, and then it ends up making a more safe and secure environment for everybody. Managers and other team members, even if they're not managers, should be encouraged to have more coworkers and employees talk about lived experiences because it can really unlock, a, I think, a lot more potential. It just makes the work better. It makes working making work more productive. It's just, it's just great across the board. So I would also encourage people to just consider open to talking about their own lived experiences, whether it's a presentation or a Q&A or something like that um, within, their own, within their own companies. That's great advice. Really, really interesting, especially in a moment when you're trying to figure out how to connect with people, how to build rapport, you're more distributed, 
and like sort of the old ways of, you know, we're going to go get drinks together after work. We're going to do it. Like those things are, are harder in there. You're looking for these other points of connection, I think. Yeah, we did this workshop with a with a studio um, recently. We did a, a six week long workshop uh, specifically focused on decolonization and divestment. And our second hour together, everyone was in charge of talking about narratives that they tell themselves. Everyone talked about very intimately some of their fears, some of their insecurities. When they mentioned those in front of other people, everyone else was like, that shouldn't be a fear. Like, let's talk about how we can make our work together more productive to make sure that you know that you have the support that you need, right? So when you when you are more vulnerable and you say, hey, I have or I live with this aspect of my identity, here's how you can support me better so that way I am a happier employee here and I'm more productive, et cetera. It's a win-win-win for everybody. So I think like continuing to invite like facilitators, if people aren't comfortable doing it themselves, inviting facilitators or facilitating their own kind of workshops where they're talking about some of these aspects can really help with everything across the board. So that's just one example of seeing work that we've done with with brands and make environments that are a lot more safer. I mean, it, you know, in general, ties in with your message of abundance versus scarcity. What skills you need to move on in careers and as they're different than crafts often, they're different than how good you are at the core job and they're about these other things. And then, you know, for leaders and managers, getting the most out of people isn't just like having the smartest people, whatever smartest means. Sorry, I probably should have put quotes. Um, you know, it's it's about having a group of people together who are additive to each other. And you're describing some situations, some ways of, of making that happen. Um, really fascinating to learn about, um, to hear about. I've loved in prepping for this, uh, just learning more about useful school and you. And I'm I'm just grateful for the time and the perspective. Thank, thank you. Ateesh. Yeah, thank you so much. I was so excited to not only prepare for this. I could barely sleep last night. I was up until 3 a.m. just like so excited and tingly. And I was like, all right, we finally made this happen. I'm like so stoked. Uh, I got a beard trim. I, like everything was great. Uh, I, I mean, I even I even painted my nails, but my nails are like a little bit, um, they're a little bit worn from working out. I don't know if you can see it. I mean, it's like that. There you go. Uh, wow. One of my, yeah, one of my, uh, one of the graduates of useful school gave me this um, incredible nail polish. I've been using it. It just rubs off quite quickly when I'm working out. So, uh, but yeah, so it's a feature in some contexts and maybe a bug in others. It's a feature. It's a benefit. It's a story. It's everything. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for joining us on Fig Brew, Ratish. Uh, and you know, maybe we'll have you back on. I would love to come back on, please. Don't make promises you can't keep. I would love to come back on. <laughs> Bye for now. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks.